This holy verse 46 of Surah Al-Anfal addresses the believers who stand at the front lines of serving the religion of Islam. All those who are in a position where they serve Islam in any way are addressed by this holy verse. First and foremost, it addresses the people who stood to defend Islam against all types of attacks. But as we know, attacks against Islam are not limited to the military attacks. Intellectual attacks are also attacks, and they are not less severe than military attacks. So there's a lot of different ways by which we can serve Islam and defend Islam. This verse addresses you if you have any position, be it big, be it small, whatever it may be, in that position you serve the religion of Islam. You serve the mission of the Ahlul Bayt What is this verse saying to the mu'mineen? And what is it warning them against? This holy verse is cautioning the mu'mineen and mu'minat who are in the service of Islam, cautioning and warning them against allowing their differences to escalate to conflict. It is natural that we differ. We're human beings. We're not expected to have the same opinion about everything. You may like to carry out a specific task in a specific way, and I like to carry out a little bit different. That's normal. As long as we are not differing with respect to the values, as long as we are not violating the essentials, we have the right to differ. You believe that serving Islam should be done in this way, and I believe it should be done in that way. That is absolutely normal. What is not normal and what this verse condemns is when we allow the difference of opinion to escalate to conflict. That is what Islam warns us from. Why? Because conflict usually leads to فتفشلوا. Fashal means failure. Failure. Our strength is there and our success is there when we are together, united in serving Islam. But once we begin to differ and disunite, then our efforts will go with the wind. فَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Your power, your energy, all that would go would vanish. وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا Do not do tanazu. Tanazu comes from the word niza, which means dispute. And dispute is not differing. Again, differing is normal. We have to differentiate between having a difference. I prefer this color, you prefer that color. That's a difference, but that's not a dispute. Dispute is when I allow the difference to become a fight, to turn into animosity. And usually differences escalate to conflict because they are dealt with from an egocentric standpoint. But if they are dealt with from an Islamic etiquette standpoint, they will never turn into conflict. Why? Because as Muslims, whatever we're doing, we're doing it with this intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we differ, we always keep in mind that this is done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, we should never allow that difference to defeat the purpose, which is to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turn it into a conflict and a fight. In this lecture, I'll present four important guidelines and etiquette that are taught to us by Islam from the Quran, from the ahadith of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt on how we deal with differences and not allow them to escalate to conflict. Number one, to recognize and be mindful of the fact that the person that you are differing with is a mu'min. Oftentimes that is overlooked. Sometimes when we differ with someone, in the back of our mind, that person is no longer the mu'min. This person is Yazid. They're the enemy of Islam. And therefore, the way we deal with them is going to be very harsh and abusive. No, no, no. Remember, the person, and why do I say mu'min? Because, we're, again, we're talking about working together to serve Islam. It's a mu'min. It's a believing brother or a believing sister. So recognize that they are a mu'min before you react. What does it mean to be a mu'min? Hmm. Let's visit some of the ahadith by the Ahlul Bayt, and I want to begin by a hadith which is reported by a Shaykh al-Saduq in his book, Al-Khisal 
attributed to our sixth Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhi salam. In this hadith he says, Al-Mu'minu a'zamu hurmatan min al-Ka'bah. A mu'min, a believer, has a greater sanctity than that of the Kaaba. So how do you deal with the Kaaba? You deal with it with all respect. Imam Sadiq says no, but a mu'min has a higher status, higher sanctity. That when we say that the mu'min has a higher sanctity than that of the Kaaba, that means anything that could be offensive to that mu'min, any form of adhiyya, abuse, or harm to that mu'min would be considered waging a war with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Am I exaggerating? No. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a Qudsi hadith, in Al-Kafi by a Shaykh Al-Kulayni radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this Qudsi hadith, لِيَأْذَنَ بِحَرْبٍ مِنِّي مَنْ آذَى عَبْدِيَ mu'min. Let him, whoever harms my believing servant, expect a war from me. It's not something that we should take easy. When we differ with a mu'min, we need to remember these things. This is a mu'min. So whatever I will say, I have to keep in mind the fact that they have a special hurma, special status. And number two, if I were to offend them or hurt them in any way, shape or form, I have waged a war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, when we differ, what are we differing about? We're differing about a specific matter, thinking that our opinion, my opinion, is right, and their opinion about this matter is wrong. Now, the fact that I think their opinion is wrong stems from what? What is my explanation of why they have arrived at this opinion? There are multiple possibilities. Possibility number one, they made a mistake, and it's normal, we're human beings. Possibility number two, they have high ego and they want things to only go their way. But Islam says we can't go with possibility too. Why? Because you are supposed to give your brother or your sister the benefit of the doubt. And that is guideline number two. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Why are we always tapping into people's intentions as if we are the malaika that can read the intentions? Why is it that when I differ with someone I assume the worst? And that they intend this and they intend that as if Allah has given me all the powers to tap into their intentions and read their mind. How do I know? The commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. As reported in Nahjul Balagha, he says, amra akhika ala ahsanih hatta yati kama yaglibuka min. He says, place the affair of your brother in the best possible context until you get a proof which convinces you of the contrary. Ahsani. So if there is Hassan and Ahsan, you have to go for Ahsan. The best possible explanation for why they made this mistake. If I keep this in mind, my reaction to that difference of opinion is going to be much softer. Because now... First of all, I'm thinking this is a mu'min. They have a very special status. Number two, maybe this decision of theirs stemmed from an error, a mistake. So that means they haven't intended to make that mistake, right? So that takes us to number three. What is number three? Guideline number three. This is a mu'min I'm dealing with. I have to be respectful of them. Maybe they made a mistake in that opinion of theirs, that decision of theirs. But let's go on to three. What is three? Gift them that mistake or that flaw. Why do I use the word gift? Is it the difference between pointing out the flaw and between gifting the flaw? Ahlul Bayt say, don't point the flaw, gift it. Subhanallah, what's the difference? Well, there's a difference. When you have a gift, you wrap it in a very nice wrapping bag, put it in a gift bag, and when you give it, you give it with a smile. I've never seen in my life, and I don't think you've seen as well, a person wrap a gift in a trash bag or a bag that is meant for toilet paper, and they give it to the person by tossing it in their face. I don't think that would be considered a gift in any way, shape, or form. It would not be accepted. 
So you gift someone, you present that which you present to them in the best demeanor, in the best fashion, in the best way possible. And this is a hadith attributed to our beloved Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Also in Al-Kafi, he says, أَحَبُّ إِخْوَانِي إِلَيَّ مَنْ أَهْدَى إِلَيَّ عُيُوبِي He says, the most dearest of my brothers is one who gives me my flaws. Not points them out, gifts them to me. أَهْدَى Imam alayhi salam teaches us to consider criticism and positive feedback as a gift, not to be offended by it. So the person who's offering it has to offer it in a good package so that it can be received well. And the person who is receiving it need to see that it is a gift and not an offensive comment. It works both ways. The person who is giving has to be mindful how they give it. And the person who is receiving has to also give the benefit of the doubt to the one who has given it to them, that they are giving it because they care about them and care about that which they are aiming to accomplish. Number four. Mawlana, I tried, I pointed out the comment, I spoke to them nicely about it, I mentioned that this is wrong, but they still never took it from me. Go on to the fourth guideline. Have a discussion with them. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, argue with them in that which is best. Choose the best way of bringing this up to them and having a discussion. Oftentimes, our discussions do not reap much fruit is because of the way we approach them. Jidal means fight, quarrel, yell, shout, high tone, you, you, you did this, you did that. Blaming them, pointing fingers, that is not jidal. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Keeping in mind kindness in the way we present our argument. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ He says, tell my servants to say that which is best. Indeed, Satan induces dissent among them. Indeed, Satan is ever to mankind a clear enemy. Well, these are four important guidelines that we have to bear in mind and keep in mind when we deal with differences. Again, we are not differing on personal matters. We are differing on matters that we claim contribute to the service of Islam. Most of the times when we work together in serving Islam, we're doing it on a voluntary basis. And that also has to be considered. We have to show that appreciation. So these four guidelines are important to keep in mind. Number one, understand that the person that we're differing with is a mu'min. They have a special status. Number two, give them the benefit of the doubt. Why assume that they are a demon from the first thought? And number three, gift them that flaw or the fact that the opinion in your perspective is a wrong opinion. The decision from your perspective their decision is a wrong decision. Gift it to them. Point it out to them in the nicest way. And number four, have a discussion with them. بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ We beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us success to implement these guidelines. And we beseech Him to eradicate any level of grudge or animosity that we may have in our hearts against one another. Because that is really what surely distances us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and weakens us. Allah in the Quran says that وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ Mu'minun and Mu'minat are loyalists to one another, guardians of one another, not enemies of one another. But we have to revisit how we deal with one another, my dears. Because if I allow my ego to drive how I deal with others as opposed to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for me, then I'm not really genuine in my claim that I am truly a Muslim. God-centricity means this, means that whatever I do in life stems from the fact that I am God-conscious. Is this what Allah wants? Is this what Allah expects? Not what my desires want. But before we unleash our desires and unleash our words, which could cause a lot of pain for other people, let us think 
about these four guidelines that were mentioned. We ask Allah by the love of Muhammad and his progeny to grant us the success to remain firm on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Tonight, we commemorate the death of one of our Imam Hussein, peace be upon him's daughters. According to one historical source, she was a young daughter. The source does not name her. We know her as Ruqayya, as Sakina. Does not mention the name. It just says that Al Hussein alayhi salam had a young daughter in the ruins of Sham. Now, this is from Imaduddin al Tabari, a Shia historian, not the Sunni Tabari. This is a Shia Tabari. Imaduddin al Tabari, he lived in the 7th Hijri century, and his book is called Kamilul Baha'i. In that book, he mentions the story of this little girl who was in the ruins of Sham. What happened to that little girl who was in the ruins of Sham? He says that while she's asleep, she woke up. But when she woke up, she woke up and burst in crying and wailing. What is she crying? Father, Abba Hussein. Uridu Abi al Hussein. As if she saw a dream. What did she see in that dream? Possibly what she saw in that dream. Her father, Al Hussein, alayhi salam. She woke up and realized this was a dream. I want my father. Take me to my father. As she's crying and wailing, the women around her and children begin to cry, begin to mourn, begin to wail. According to this narration, Yazid alayhi la'na hears of the wailing and crying. So he says to them, what is the problem? They say to him, there is a little daughter for Hussein who is asking for her father. He says, send her father to her. They send the head of Hussein. They remove the cloth. The little girl is shocked to see the head of Hussein soaked in blood. Baba Hussein, the last time I saw you, that wasn't how I saw you.